Good morning, friends. Um, if I look a little funny, it's because I'm wearing a post-surgical brace. I had my appendix out two days ago or two evenings ago. Long story short, I was having some pain over days and actually if I think back weeks and if I think back further, actually years. So I could have had like maybe a low grade infection in my appendix the whole time. It was hurting all night one night and I wasn't sleeping. The next morning it just really started getting worse and worse. Fortunately I had you know, people to get me to the hospital. By the end of that day, I had been through surgery and walked out feeling way better. I literally woke up off the surgical table feeling way better than when they put me under. So I, I think everything's gonna go okay, but I'm not supposed to lift anything or do much for like seven days. So I just wanted to do this off the cuff video. But I was answering comments this morning and one comment just kind of stimulated my brain a little bit as often happens. And it had to do with terminology of sawing. So in my last, I think it was my last video or set of videos I was talking about how, like looking at these diagrams, how boards are oriented in the log. Like when you take, how you take them out of the log and that has everything to do with how stable they are, uh, what the grain looks like, how it warps or doesn't. Anyway, I'd use this terminology in there, uh, rift sawn, which is what I call, you know, this right here. And someone took issue with that and asserted that that was incorrect and that, you know, riff song is actually this other thing. L let me just back up for a second. So this video is about two things, this subject, but more importantly, and it's going to be the more bulk of this video, is about language and terminology and how those affect our thinking and this is so this is going to be an off the cuff video so it's going to be very very far from a, a complete cohesive argument but it'll make enough of an argument to get people you know thinking a little bit because one of my core philosophies has become the way i started to say it is that words are not things and this comes from you know my observations of watching people interact especially on the internet me interacting with people on the internet watching my own thinking and my own evolution about language and how I viewed language and how I viewed the importance of, of terminology and definition. Another commenter recently turned me on to the phrase, the map is not the territory. Yeah, that's exactly what I'm saying. The map is not the territory. And this is extremely important for understanding how things work. And I'm going to make an argument basically that not only do I think that language is fluid and we have to recognize that, but to actually have a somewhat of a disdain for definition, considering it of lesser importance, like the actual terminology of things, will make you a more effective thinker and better able to understand things and how they work. Now that could seem like a contradiction to some people, but I'll, I'll make my argument about, about that too. So first to the topic at hand. How you take a board out of a log is super important. I'm gonna go get some boards out of my just scrap wood pile that are you know, all aged and kind of messed up to prove some points. So someone who hasn't worked with wood very much probably just sees a board and it's like, oh, a board's a board and it's this dimension, right? How the board is taken out of the log has everything to do with how awesome or not of a board it is. Two very common grain orientations are vertical, and uh, what we might call horizontal. I, I'm just talking about boards here. And again, this terminology is messy. So don't, don't you know, grammar Nazi my terminology because I'm gonna actually explain what I mean. Okay, so one way would be if the growth rings are oriented this way and the other one would be if they're oriented this way. And then obviously there can be anything in between those two extremes. So let's just draw one that's at 45 degrees except for if you're after a specific pattern of some kind or some kind of really specialized use this is worse than these two and this is more ideal because of its stability but this is pretty good too uh, if it's at an angle like that and then this is the worst so i have two fence boards here it might not look like much to you, but this is a gorgeous, awesome piece of wood. This is old growth redwood, and it has the grain oriented, you know, roughly up and down this way. It's really more about like, four, it's more like 45 degrees, but this is a stable, uh, beautiful board. It has very few cracks, except there were nails or at the ends here, and it's pretty flat. In the same pile, I grabbed this, uh, not because I wanted it, but because I thought it might make a good example of what's called a plain sawn board, which is more like this orientation. You now this is covered with cracks. This whole face is just checked. There's, there's literally, it looks like hundreds of cracks on here. 
this side's a little better, but not, not great. And it's, the whole board is cupped, you know, as it seasoned and dried or sat around in the sun or whatever, it, it formed this kind of like arc like that. These two pieces of wood could be completely equivalent in terms of like their structure, right? They could have come out of the same exact log and you can get this much of a drastic difference in these two pieces of wood because of where they're cut out of the log and how they're cut. Now, to the terminology around that. So I use these uh, usually. There's more ways to do this and there's more terms. Do a search on rift sawing or quarter sawing or quarter sawing, rift sawing, plane sawing, flat sawing, any of those terms. Sort by images so you have all the images on the internet about this and start looking through them and you will find that there is very little consensus on these terms. I use these because they seem to be common and they make sense to me. So this, this just points out that there's no consensus or authority on this terminology. This is not how it works. It's not like these, you know, the words are not the things. The words are symbols, things that we use to try to communicate with each other. And obviously that's important. Like. If I work with you in a cabinet shop or something, you know, we need to have some kind of consensus on the terminology, right? Whether it's there already or not, we're going to come up with something where, you know, when I say quarter sawn or whatever, you're going to know what I'm talking about. So that's obviously important. But the process of that happening, like we can't have this fixation on this idea of like a language authority. There are institutions that aim to do that. What it's really a convention is what it is. But those people work constantly adding new words, modifying things, you know, adding definitions and changing things because language is fluid. Language is a social phenomenon. You know, we have these words that started way back there and over time they just keep changing. And then, you know, uh, say like Europeans come over here and we develop a new terminology that's separate from, you know, terminologies that were used in Europe, but they have their roots in the same words and the same ideas. So the way these things develop is an organic process, whether it's social isolation or actual physical isolation. So before I go off on that anymore, let me just cover these terms and why I think there's, there's an issue with uh, this inconsistency in the terminology. First of all, there's just that organic process that happens and, you know, things diverge. But I think a major issue with this topic is we have two different groups of people or trades that are discussing grain orientation. Sawyers, the people who cut the wood out, and the other one is woodworkers. For the sawyer, in that, in that I believe is where this language came from, is from the sawyer. From the sawyer's point of view, it's all about how he's going about cutting out these pieces of wood. Like, how is this person going to strategize to get pieces of wood out of the log, either efficiently or to get a certain effect? And then the woodworker is getting the finished piece, and they're going to say, oh, this has this great, this type of saw orientation, and I'm going to call it, you know, quarter sawn or rip sawn or whatever. I'm pretty sure that where this terminology probably came from, and this is my best guess, is that in quarter sawing, you actually cut the log into quarters, and then you take these pieces like that. And what that gives you is, since the rings are like this, the grain orientation in these quarter sawn pieces varies from 45 degrees to 90 degrees. The grain will be basically 90 degrees, almost to the middle. And then towards the middle, it's just going to shift a little bit like this. And as you go out here, this is going to be a little more like that. In terms of stability of the wood and the quality of the wood, like this is very high quality, stable wood. With rift sawing, what I call rift sawing, again, you know, I'm not, I don't, I'm not attached to this terminology. I'm just saying that this, this is the terminology I use and why. This is horribly inefficient. You know, you have to like keep messing with the log, but you're literally wasting wedges of wood in here. Like with the quarter saw, and you cut it into quarters, and then you saw a flat face off, and then you turn it and you saw board off the other flat face, then you turn it and you saw board off the other flat face, right? Dot, 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 like this. So that's a pain in the butt compared to plain. Look how easy this is. 
right? So we're just gonna go in here and slice, 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 like you'd have a bandsaw mill or something like that, super easy. This is quite a bit harder, but it's not like this. Like this is crazy. You gotta keep, uh, you know, changing the wood around or you're gonna cut out like these kind of wedges and then slice the side off of it or something like that. What I think is that this term and this method came from the idea that it, this is like split wood. Okay, so the last video I did was about uh, splitting out these wedges out of a log. So I'm splitting the log into these long rails, right? And naturally you're just gonna split through the middle, then split again, then you keep splitting and having these wedges and you end up with basically, yeah, a wedge. Think of this terminology, rift, which basically means uh, to tear or, you know, open up, a uh, rend, a uh, rive, let me write those down. <clears throat> Look at the phonetic similarity of these words, which all are related to this idea. So rift is to like tear or rend. Uh, rive is splitting boards out of a log. So I think this, this terminology basically derives from a time when people are doing what I usually do, which is take you know a piece of wood or a log and split it, end up kind of splitting into quarters and then split out these pieces. And the advantage, of course, is that every single board is 100% 90 degree orientation to the growth rings. Let me um, grab something. And that's what allows me, for instance, in this board, I don't know if you can see it, but the radial um, rays here, the medullary rays, go almost all the way across the board because this, this orientation is almost a perfect 90. Like wood isn't consistent enough for you to get a perfect 90. That's just not you know, that's not in the cards, but it's the closest you can get. So I think that this terminology probably derives from riving, essentially, and, and doing it that way. And so if you want, if you're like a fine woodworker or you have a super picky client or something, you, you just want to make the most of this or you want this exact pattern where these these uh, medullary rays in the, in the oak or in other woods go all the way across or really far across, then, you know, someone deems it worth doing this method, throwing away some wood and just essentially wasting some wood, taking way longer to do it. Now the comment that I was, I'm referring to, uh, he, he uses a different terminology and says that this 45 degree angle is what he calls rips on. And, but there's just tons of confusion. Like if you go and look at message boards and start reading this stuff, you know, there just is, there is no consensus on the terminology here. This is my best guess of how this developed, but I'm not making an argument that we should, you know, strictly stick to this or anything like that because I honestly don't care that much. The main point is that, you know, words are not things, the map is not the territory, and it's very important to remember this. I see conversations go on, and I've had conversations in the past, and this is why I changed the way I think about this stuff, where the terminology just got in way of the understanding of, this, of the subject. You know, you could make an argument, and this is kind of the argument for grammarism, is that if we don't have consistent terminology, we have conversations that don't make any sense. We could have, and I've seen these discussions, and I've had them myself, the terms and the meaning and the understanding of the subject is not well defined, and that the substitute is supposed to be these words, but they're not working, right? There's a, there's a miscommunication and there's a lack of understanding, and the words are like a substitute for the understanding. Because if you know some words, you can still have a conversation, it just doesn't, you know, it doesn't ensure that the conversation has any depth or meaning or accuracy. So that's one argument is to say that we need consistency. We need these conventions. They need to be, you know, set in stone. Uh, words are symbols and they're obviously essential. Language is, is beautiful. I'm in love with language. Language is beautiful and amazing, but it's limiting and it's not an accurate representation of the world we live in. It is not the things that we're talking about. I was pretty much one of these grammar Nazi grammarists, you know, grammar Nazis. And I would be like, no, you know, don't call that that because then we don't know what we're talking about. That's an incorrect term. That's not the proper term, you know. What I noticed is eventually is that there were conversations going on where there was no understanding of the subject or the subject understanding was shallow. You get people that use terms often in the strongest sense because they don't understand the subject. Another thing that happened to me is I started running into situations where I could not find the language to describe what I wanted, what I was seeing, like what I was observing or, or thinking. And I would start to run into these language walls where I couldn't communicate with people 
about a subject without making up a term or defining what I meant in long form, right? Having to like write out a bunch of stuff to, to explain. I still find myself doing that a lot. These cracks started to, to develop in this idea that language is, you know, adequate to the task basically, and that we should have these like strict definitions because we live in a prison of language and our, our society. And language is, is just this like, epic reflection of the society that we live in and the way that our society thinks, you know, whichever society you're in. Because of that, there are certain limitations of thinking, you know, like one society and language may have a much more emotional intelligence, let's say, and another language may have a much more like cerebral, logical intelligence. And these are, you know, these are reflected in the language itself. We grow up in these situations, right, we, we are a product of the societies we grow up in and therefore of the language, then we live within these certain limitations, right? Now, you can never escape that prison. The, the concept that once you start to be closer and closer to being a free thinker, the more you realize that you live in a cage and that you can never escape this, this cage. What you can do, well, I wouldn't say never, but you know, as for practical purposes as hum as normal human beings unless you're going to meditate in a cave for the rest of your life or you know live on psychedelic drugs or something uh, you know we have these limitations and what we can do is is a realize that that they're there and accept that they're there and this is what i'm arguing for instead of just deny being in denial and then we can expand our horizons right we can find ways we can expand the prison basically we can we can open new doors and corridors if we accept our language like as this kind of languageism uh, grammarism thing as being ultimate as being fixed as being adequate we are limiting our thinking when someone really gets on my case not not this recent comment wasn't wasn't horrible or anything but when someone really gets on my case about some kind of grammarism or it's just like super nitpicky i'm just like this is a small mind you know like i don't really i don't want to talk to this person because they don't understand this fundamental important idea that words are not things and they do not substitute for understanding in any way they can help us understand uh both the um by communication like learning from other people or teaching people they can also help us understand because we primarily think in language, although it's not the only the only way we think, and that's just another subject about um, intuition. Other symbolic ways of thinking that may be unique to an individual or that may be more of uh, archetypal based. Anyway, that's another thing. So what I'm trying to say is that the words are important. Language is extremely important. It, it's like also kind of what makes it all possible, but this is not I'm not making an either or argument, you know, like we tend to want to make these either or arguments. You're like, I'm pro, you know, logic and I'm pro intuition and people head off and like, I'm pro grammar and it's, it's important that we use the right terms. Well, you can do both, you know, you can do both. What I'm advocating for is not a rejection of language. I'm not arguing against language convention. I'm arguing that they are inadequate and that they're limiting and they're not, they're not a complete tool set. I'm arguing for seeing things for what they are rather than what we call them. So this is a difference. So don't, don't get into this like polarized mindset where, you, where there's just two sides. It, this is how most people think. We th we're binary thinkers, you know, we're binary animals and people divide into these extreme camps and then they just butt heads over like ideologies and terminologies that actually lose their meaning. They, you know, they lose their meaning and it's just these, these words and it's like, and everyone's like, rah, 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 and they're just arguing about nothing because, you know, it's just a bunch of people that don't actually, they're not actually talking about what any of this means. And the words become substitutes for uh, any kind of um, real discussion. It's just unconstructive monkeys chattering like some that they learned, you know, some language that they, they picked up and these like ideas that are really ill-defined and not well thought out. Here's what I recommend. Just try this on for size. Words are not things and they, they're 
inadequate at representing reality. Just try to start taking that default view a little bit. Adopt one of these phrases, uh, either, you know, mine, which is words are not things, or the map is not the territory is wonderful. That's that's an awesome way to say it. Adopt one of these ideas as a, as a phrase, so, you know, to help you navigate. Just start looking at the world that way. When you catch yourself or someone else saying that this is a this is a, you know, hatchet, this is a, a hammer, or this is a, this type of hammer. This is the tool that most people call a hatchet instead. And this is clunky, and I'm not saying that you should always think in these terms all the time. This is a way of training your mind to think in a different way. Think that way instead of saying, this is, you know, what, I could say, for instance, you know, this is what most people seem to call plain sawn. Okay, that's a very different statement than saying that this is a plain sawn board. This is what it is. This is not the term we use to describe it, or that some people use to describe it, or that most people use to describe it, or even that 100% of people use to describe it. This is what it is. In order to understand this, now think about this. If you approach things that way, suddenly you're thinking you're thinking about it right you have to think about it because you no longer can use a buzzword to just like stick it in this category and boom you know you're done with it it's a planes on board you know door closed conversation finished the way that is useful that type of thing is useful is just to get through the day right we can't we can't just say oh hi joe i have this board here and it's what most people probably i think would call a plain on board where the grain is, you know, whatever, it's too clunky, right? But there is a use, especially when you're thinking about a subject deeply and you want to understand that subject a lot better, or for retraining your mind to think more in terms of what things are than what we call them, there's definitely a place for um, doing that and, and, and like digging in and, and nerding out on what a thing is and how it works instead. So, you know, I found that with certain subjects, I'm able to understand the subject a lot better in, an, in a more integrated way, like a, a way that makes more sense to me. It, ultimately, I end up being able to describe to other people better because I don't rely on terminology and I'll actually often go out of my way to avoid learning terminology around a subject because it forces me to always be thinking and kind of reinventing the wheel like people say well why would you don't reinvent the wheel why would you reinvent the well screw that we should reinvent the wheel all the time you know especially people like me who are really exploratory oriented and you know are interested in really understanding things if you're not reinventing the wheel, you're just accepting what everyone else already decided was true. That's just like groupthink mentality, right? And the same with language. If, if you buy into this idea that these conventions are always correct and that we should always use the same conventions and never flout them and, and, you know, and try to nail them down as hard as we can you know, with dictionaries and these institutions that come up with the definitions for things that are considered the authorities, we are we are accepting groupthink. That's my suggestion: is just try to start rewiring your brain around around language and start playing with it. You know, screw around with with language. Like, make up new. I love making up new words. When you see people arguing about terminology, just know whether they're arguing about the terminology ends up improving or or unimproving the understanding of the subject and whether they're talking about the subject. Here's a great example. So one of my most popular videos is uh, Stop Burning Brush. <clears throat> and I'm just arguing that people should not just burn their brush into ashes or the uh, the activity that, like if I, if I walked up to 100 people on the street and I said, you know, go burn that pile of brush for me, what are they gonna do? Almost all of them are gonna burn it. They're gonna think I want that brush gone. They're gonna burn it to ashes and it's gonna, you know, be gone and out of my way. It's like a disposal thing, right? Uh, my argument is that people shouldn't do that, but instead like manage the pile to get some charcoal out of it that can be used as a soil amendment. So on that video, a lot of people take issue with me saying stop burning brush and then lighting a, a pile of brush on fire. That's my, my artistic license at work. And I'm just saying the activity that everyone knows as burning brush, I'm not doing. And I'm arguing for, a, for doing something else with it. 
it's definitely partly to get people to, to look at the video. I think it's the best title for that video, and that's actually why it's so popular, is because that's a great title. But people argue about that, and that that's inaccurate, because I'm lighting on fire, there's fire involved, right? So then that's inherently inaccurate, and they get mad about it, right? And the other thing that happens on that video a lot is people will say, you know, I end up with this black stuff at the end, right? There's about 50 gallons of black charred stuff. There's comments that are like, that is not biochar, that's charcoal. And then other comments that say that's not charcoal. No one in any of those comments has told me what it actually is if it's not charcoal. I was like, well, what's, what's this black stuff, right? And I think that if you go back, th there may be a time when people would have referred to that as cinders, just like these black, you know, charred pieces of wood left in a fire, whereas charcoal may, you know, may have been reserved for wood that was prepared more carefully uh, because charcoal that's prepared carefully for things like blacksmithing and smelting metals and cooking on and stuff like that is a, is a fairly different product than what I'm producing. I'm producing like a pretty soft, porous, lightweight, low fuel value uh, chunk of charred stuff, whatever, you know. But what I've noticed is that those people are never contributing to the conversation. What I'm talking about, like any, any important point I've made, like what is this stuff? You know, I don't care what you call it. Can we talk about the stuff that it is and why it does or doesn't work? They're just there to try to correct me on the terminology, which I honestly don't just don't care about that much. I'm making this stuff. I, I described how it works. I described that it works for me. What's the point of of correcting my my definition? If you have one, let's hear it. You know, I'm I'm I don't and I don't care. Like I, I'm totally open to the idea of starting to use, say, the term cinders for that and charcoal for you know, something that's created with a lower oxygen environment. You know, we could talk about it, but this this whole grammar Nazi grammarism thing of just like swooping in and correcting people's language, you know, like you're some kind of grammar superhero. It's just the smallest way to think. And I've, I've just lost so much respect for that attitude. I put this to work every day of my life now. And I have this kind of developed this sort of disdain and disrespect for language that isn't you know, it isn't all inclusive. It's not that I don't appreciate language or think it's super important or that definition can be important. It's just that it's not, it's not adequate to describe uh, the world we live in or to make uh, a really effective exploration of how things work. And I'm not expecting people to watch this video and just change the way they think overnight. That doesn't, that doesn't happen. Uh, it doesn't work that way. If you want to be, you know, more effective and more free thinker, which are are synonymous by the way like you don't get one without the other if you're attached to the beliefs you have already really you know really set in stone you will fail at becoming a more free thinker because obviously you have to you have to be willing to step off the ledge a little bit and question what you know and eschew uh, the idea of belief a little bit and you can't do it completely. Like I said, we live in this prison and none of this happens in this like linear, uh, well-defined fashion. It, it's like a, it's a process and it takes time and it takes time to retrain your brain to think differently. And when I was a dumb kid, you know, teenage kid, I'm all like, think for yourself, you know, you gotta be an individual. And I didn't even, at the time, I didn't even know what that entailed. Now I know more what it entails, and it's uh, wow! It's a journey, and it's an uphill battle. It's like a, it's like swimming against the stream and against society for the rest of your life. But if you want to be what we would call an original thinker, you have to be willing to step out on a ledge and and uh, question what you think you know, and definitely question what everyone else is telling you is already known. I swear, though, someday I will I will make this all a little bit clearer and and figure out a way to describe what I'm trying to say better and map it out more well laid argument with uh, more actionable steps. But for now. You know, th those are my suggestions for how to start shifting your thinking around a little bit and just see how it works for you. This is what I really want to, I guess, get across is that if you think in these like really highly defined rigid terms, you're just, you're closing doors everywhere and you're not looking. You know, you stop looking because you've already got it figured out. This is adequately represented by this term and you, and then you just move on, you know, mentally. And if you don't do that, then you're constantly questioning everything. The world becomes 
more about questions than it does about answers. You see what I mean? Like, how arrogant is that to just always be running through the world saying, I know this, I know that, I know what that is, I know what that is. But yeah, do you know how it works? And what, what are you not seeing? What are you not asking? Because you have this idea that you're already a, so much about what you know versus what you don't know. And, you know, I'm not arguing that, that I'm like 100% effective at this, not at all. This is a messy, messy process. It's more that I embrace that insecurity of that, that view that, that, um, that the reality, what, how things really are, is way more complicated than the language that we commonly use to describe it. We can start to retrain ourselves to think less rigidly in terms of language. It will benefit your understanding of subjects. Okay, thank you for watching. I'm going to go rest my lack of appendix.